So um, I'm I'm just going to talk, you know, sort of briefly about about my experiences, um, a little bit about before, but also about my experiences starting up no ground. Um, now, when I left Sir Martin's your course, actually, um, I went out into the big bad world. But before then, um, you know, as, as with you guys from the work in progress, had a few, you know, a few, as you, as you probably will, got a couple of jobs. But uh, what you realize, you know, I, I, I'd say fairly quite early on is that, you know, you're going to veer towards a certain area of illustration. The illustration is very broad. Um, and some of you obviously are more suited to editorial illustration than others. Some of you are sort of natural comic book artists. So some of you are children's book illustrators. Um, and some of you are more kind of on the fine art side of things. And you, you all gravitate naturally towards your strengths. And, and when you leave, it's very much the same thing. I mean, it's not easy, it's, it's hard. But you'll find that you'll, you know, You'll, you'll kind of tend towards certain things. Um, and I think, just for starters, you know, I'd say you need to be realistic about, about who you are as an illustrator and where your efforts are directed when you leave. That's important. Personally, um, I was always straddling the line between several disciplines when I was at CSM. I started off in graphics, moved over to illustration, went um, uh, when, when my chief graphics tutor told me that I should because I was approaching most of my design projects through drawing. Um, and then I, then I moved briefly into animation and, and I worked as an animator for a while after I left. Um, but I was also working as an illustrator. So I did, ended up doing a lot of different things. And one of the things that I did that kind of actually in part, led to know where I was. Whilst I was at St. Martin's, I was working freelance as an animation assistant, and I was working freelance on live, live action films as well, mainly for com commercials, music videos, and stuff like that. That's where I met Sam, and we started working together. So, um, obviously, I, I studied illustration at St. Martin's, but um, I suppose No Brow came out of collaborations in an entirely different field, which is interesting because what No Brow is about, even though it's about print and about, um, and about you know, illustration in a very pure sense, um, we also draw kind of it from the experiences and the talents of, of lots of different arts, graphic arts related um, uh, uh, disciplines, including animation. Macbeth, for example, is an animator first and an illustrator. You know, uh, as, a, as a hobby, if you will. So it's important to understand that it's kind of, you know, um, from from fairly um, diverse background that we came to. But ultimately, no brow is about illustration and about promoting illustration in in, in every in its every guise. And um, and when we started, um, we just thought that we wanted to place focus on quality. On set standards for the work that we were publishing, uh, a standard for the work that the industry was kind of using as well, and to change what we thought was kind of a bit of a stale sort of scene at the time that was mainly, um, you know, geared towards supporting graduates of the RCA and streamlining them into various, um, you know, sort of areas of the industry. And what we wanted to do is really to, to talk about the work for its own sake. You know, illustration, for its own sake, it doesn't matter if you went to Falmouth or CSM or whatever. If your work was good, your work would speak for itself. That's all we need. Um, sort of a bit of a utopian view of things and perhaps a bit misguided in some respects, but certainly some of the artists that we've worked with over, over the years have, have benefited from it like to think we made a contribution in some sense. Um, this is a starting point in No Rouse, it's our collections, you know, Sam and I 
we collect old books and comics and ephemera and you know I collect these crazy Japanese toys that are really way you know too expensive for what they are. Um, and and really, you know, our our inspiration for our books comes very much from, you know, I'd say the nostalgia for for printed products when, when they were a little when a bit more attention was lavished upon them. When they weren't just kind of, you know, released, you know, sort of in, in, a, in a relatively ad hoc fashion based on just doing the cheapest and the as possible. Um, so books like this, for example, like old Japanese Toho uh, books. Toho is a, 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 uh, a company that, that produced films like Godzilla and Mothra and this kind of thing. And they had these really beautiful books with all of these crazy characters in them and, and, and you know, the illustrations were really self-indulgent and, you know, we love And, um, but also, you know, kind of in general, this sort of aesthetic of uh, this older type of printmaking, which is using a process called spot color printing, where, you know, you're not just, you know, printing things in CMYK, you're actually working with separations. As the artist, you're you're working in separations rather than working just on Photoshop document, flattening it and sending it to the printers. So it was very much a lot of printmaking as well, which kind of brought, brought things to a head. Um, this I always use because it's a really interesting example of how limits, you know, in color use, um, produce great results. Uh, this this image is actually created out of out of uh, four sort of handmade separations of sight. Magenta, uh, uh, black and yellow, which is a CMYK process, is what's used in printmaking widely today. Um, but because then they had to create all of the separations by hand using letter set half tones and all sorts of things, um, they weren't able to get the kind of photographic clarity that they were able to get now with, with printing. So, um, you know, the choice to use this yellow, for example, in the background was really to give punch to the page, and that's 100% yellow. And even though you would never see that in nature, um, the fact that they were kind of limited in their design choices by the limitations of the technology um, created something that was beautiful, because I think that you know, working within creative limits is important, but, but also working within kind of some, some sort of technical constraint also produces interesting projects, because if you're just working with color, uh, you know, from a, a completely, you know, uh, in a completely abstract sense, you have, you know, millions of colors to choose from. Um, you don't know where to start. And as soon as you're limited, you can say, okay, this is all I, I have as a choice for this, so I have to use it to represent something. And thinking about colors in an abstract way like that, I think leads to, you know, really nice printing, really nice design. Um, this is also in here because we, um, this, this is basically a, a, a book about, about uh, printing books which was made by Ladybird and the, in the back of the book um, there was a little diagram of, of how this specific book was made out of a large sheet of B1 paper and some cardboard. And it explains the whole thing, it explains the whole process. And throughout the book, you understand everything about how print, printing is done, the modern process, but also all the processes like screen printing. But you'll, it also explains offset photography. Even though it's not a very trendy book and it's not kind of published by Lawrence King, it's not new. It's actually a really nice little book. It's, like, it's written, obviously, for, you know, I guess young teenagers, you know, and it's, I think, from the, the 80s or something. But, um, but it's a really nice little introduction to a lot of very important aspects of the printmaking process, of the printing process. Um, there, for example, you can see how bindings are made, um, and you can see how they're served, and you can see how the covers are affixed. And I mean, obviously, we knew these things anyway from studying them, you know, um, at, at school. But but still, you know, it's kind of it, it, it showed how Ladybird used. The, the production process is to save money, and, and that was really another thing that was important to us. We started out small, so we had to use design to, 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 to kind of 
cut corners because we, we weren't able to ship our print projects off to China or anything like that like a lot of publishers do. We had to do them locally and they're expensive. So it was about using the paper and all of the aspects of design to our advantage in order to make um, some economies where we could. Um, this is sad slide, it's just you, you really like this. Um, Charlie Harper, it's kind of random. Um, uh, this is, um, so this is a screen printing studio downstairs in our in, in the Brow sort of office studio. And when we started, we did a lot of screen printing books. Um, and uh, it was really, you know, initially that's Clark who, who no longer works with us, but um, at the beginning, Sam and I, as well as doing other things, were, were, were kind of uh, printing quite a few books by hand. Um, and this was important because, you know, the first magazine, No Brown Magazine, cost a lot of money to produce. And we had to go around to shops to try and sell it to them. You know, we went to the Tate, we went to all these galleries and design bookshops, and we had to be able to convince them somehow that we were capable of doing more. And at the time, the Risograph thing wasn't really popular. We didn't really know much about it, to be honest. So we thought one way of conveying the sort of quality that we were promising was by hand printing books and it's okay, we, we don't have the money to do these yet, but this is the potential for what we're doing. And that was really good because it, it allowed the bookshops and the booksellers and people who are selling that stuff to to kind of be able to put some faith in us that we weren't we weren't just kind of one trip ponies, we were gonna do one thing and then never do it again. Um, so so that that was really you know useful at the beginning. Um, and so we you know, we kind of hand bound them quite simply, just simple bound. But then we use really good paper and really good inks, and we collaborated with really good illustrators, so I think we're able to convey certain things through that. Um, and this, you know, is kind of today, it's kind of the after a long time, this sold out. I mean, it was um, it was an expensive book, it was just a 32 page style switch book, but it was hand printed, so it was 45 or 50 pounds. And we sold a hundred of these, you know, very, very quickly. Um, so later on, when we had the, you know, the means, uh, we turned it into a proper, you know, hardback book called Better Mystery. Um, this is kind of represents the, the transition from, you know, the hand printed stuff. Eventually, and obviously between then and when we were printing offset books, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of development and a number of months of kind of you know, being turned down by people and being frustrated and all the rest of it, the classic sorts of things. Um, but thanks to, you know, our online presence amongst other things, we were able to establish a fairly good reputation for ourselves quite quickly. And that meant that, you know, the shops were kind of ordering more and we were able to get a distributor. As soon as we got a distributor, we were able to, you know, to, to do larger print runs and to, to basically start publishing properly. So uh, this is our printer at the moment, Color House. Um, they've got a 10, 10 color Heidelberg press, which is very sexy for us, but it probably means nothing to you. Um, so coming, jumping back again, um, this, is, um, this is the first magazine, which I talked about. And with the first magazine, we really wanted to make a big impact. So we had to, even though we were very new and we were, we, we were really just you know, a small group, um, we wanted to get the best illustrators, so Sam and I went about bringing the people we really, really liked. You know, no matter how famous they were, we tracked them down, we rung them up, and just bullshitted them for a bit about how amazing this thing would be, and they had to believe in us and give us work for free. And really, you know, many people told us to fuck off. Um, <laughs> some people didn't, which was good, and they, they happened to be good as well. Um, the first issue of No Brow, um, I, you know, Sam and I did some illustrations in it, I designed the end papers, you know, we were very, we were involved as illustrators as well as being involved, you know, in putting it together and publishing it. Um, but this was really what, what made a big impact initially. At the time, nothing really had been pu printed, nothing was really being printed in this kind of colour separation method. Uh, it wasn't, no one was really using it. Um, and Rise of Graph hadn't really picked up, so people weren't really familiar with the techniques of using it. 
So it was kind of quite a, a different thing for people to see. You know, a whole one whole magazine just printed in blue and black, nothing else, no other colours. Big risk, you know, kind of a, a bit of a strange thing to put out there. There was no text because we decided that the illustration should speak for themselves. Um, uh, but people were receptive to it, and the fact that it was limited edition, I think, made it attractive. That was Sam's submission, and that's Bjorn's submission. Um, I did all this stuff, and um, this uh, uh, kind of weird, sort of totemic, sort of rainforesty crap um, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, this is Bjorn's submission. Bjorn's submission. Um, Anyway, it went, it went well, and we were able to go to the second edition. <coughs> Six months later, we went to the, we did the second magazine. And uh, we managed to hook up with Lex Bolex, who is this, um, this guy who's kind of really at the beginning of, of gaining notoriety as a really you know, influential and you know, um, uh, talented illustrator. And he was using this color separation method that we were using to great effect. So, um, so, so you know, he, he, he was a great person to choose for the second cover. The second theme was the jungle, the first was gods and monsters. Um, and we would try to pick themes that were very open so that people could have a lot of creative freedom. But then they were also, they were limited by the colors. And them being limited by the colors helped to tie together all of the submissions in the book. Um, this is uh, Henning Wagenbrecht, who's a really, really good artist, he's German. Um, he did stuff with Elvis Studio, like he was in this book about Elvis Studio and some other people. He did a book about, um, uh, about prank calls, uh, no, sorry, uh, spam emails, which is really nice, you should check it out. Um, so that's Mark Boutemont, who's a really famous illustrator. He did this specifically for us. Uh, we got in touch with him, we, we just, you know, bothered him until he said yes. Um, and he, he, you know, eventually did it. Uh, and then, yeah, jumping ahead, we kind of get to No Brow 4. You know, several years in, we're kind of, we had done quite a few books by now, and uh, Macbeth is someone we worked with in the first issue, and we've worked with a lot since then. We did a book um, of his, which had a record in it. It was always about playing formats, trying different designs and different types of books. That, that we thought were fun and playful and that people would be interested in. Um, and that's no round five. Um, and then jumping back to three. The reason I bring this up is because this explains roughly how the color separation process works. Um, the color separation process basically is as though you're, you're the computer and you're thinking, okay, CMYK, a, a print, is made up of tiny dots in those four colors. Um, Color working in color separations, you're thinking, instead of the computer, you're thinking, okay, how am I going to combine these four colors or five colors and create uh, kind of one colorful image that's interesting to look at? And that's really about, you know, breaking down colors and thinking in terms of primary colors, overlapping colors, and how they interact with each other. So this is a process that we go through with every artist that we work with virtually. Before they start working for us in earnest, and publishing books with us, we, um, we kind of explain this sort of process to them because it's really integral to the look and feel of our books. So as you can see there, you kind of have the yellow separation, the pink, the blue, and the dark blue, which represents the black, uh, or a dark color. And when they're overlapped, you get the image that we saw before. And this is roughly how it works. So you have the yellow first, you add the red, and the red and the yellow makes an orange, for example. Well, I mean, it's not red, it's a magenta, pinky sort of color. That makes an orange. And then you add the blue. And as you can see, the blue, where it goes, where it overlaps with the yellow, it becomes green. Where it overlaps with the pink, it becomes this sort of dark purple color. And where the three overlap, you get this brown, brownish color. And then you have the dark blue, which adds that final you know, sort of tying together, uh, uh, you know, 
crisp, crispness to the image. And that's really how, you know, this is roughly how, how the process works. Um, after five issues of the magazine, we decided that, you know, we, by that stage we started publishing a number of comics as well, under the 17 by 23 series, which I'll come back to in a minute. And as a result of that, we thought that it would be a good idea to include comics in the magazine. So that it had a bit of a wider appeal, but also so that it represented our general activities as a publisher. Um, and so we got Tom Gould to do the cover, thankfully. Um, Tom Gould and Buenola Carrera. And uh, the way that we're doing it now, and this is in part because of some comments we've had, some talk, early talks we did, that um, people would say, oh, you know, a lot of the people we work with, they're from all over the world, and some of the names are sort of gender ambiguous. And we actually try, you know, I mean, we, we put work in there for the work's sake. We're not saying oh, we need X number of women, X number of men. But we were criticized for having more guys in the book than women. So we make our effort to be completely, as far as possible, fair to <laughs> both sexes. Uh, part of the way that we do that, actually, and, and actually, you know, I think, I mean, I think it's a nice, really nice thing to do, it's a nice touch, is the, ma the magazine always has a female cover artist and a male cover artist, because it has two covers. And one of the covers is an illustration cover for the illustration side, the other cover is a comics cover for the comics side. And obviously it's not that one is, has to be mad and the other has to be mad, but there's always a female illustrator and a male illustrator, and I think that's kind of our way of saying that we're, you know, we're trying our best. Sometimes there might be more women than men, sometimes there might, but at least, you know, where we can be fair, we are. Um, anyway, so this is the comic side of, uh, of the magazine. Uh, that's the illustration side of the magazine. We always try, you know, John McNaught is someone we work with very often, and you'll see him popping up with a lot of their graphic things. But, you know, we always try to get new blood in, you know, new, new talent. So this is Joe Villian, she's from Berlin. And, um, and you know, and that's really what we're about. We're not about resting on our laurels and sticking to the same people. We really want to kind of uh, just be experimental, try new things, work with new people all the time. Um, so this is this is kind of this next slide is really about events and the importance of events and you know, kind of preparing uh, uh, platforms, you know, public platforms for the things that we do. Because as well as the online presence, which we put a lot of work into, we also curate a lot of spaces, and we get involved in a lot of exhibitions. Most recently, we had the Haywood Gallery. We took over the shop of the Haywood Gallery, and we kind of um, took it over with our products, but also we kind of uh, decorated the space. A little bit. Um, one of the early things we did was in Jagger Shoes. We had uh, the first party in Jagger Shoes, and the second party as well. And uh, it was a jungle, so we took some of the artwork, separated it out, and created this wallpaper, hand-printed wallpaper, uh, in our screen printing studio downstairs, which we, we printed these really long strips, and then we pasted up on the walls. It looked really great. We haven't been able to do that since then. Well, we did it once since then, but it's a lot of work, as you might imagine. So uh, that's what it looks like in situ. Um, and that's really important, you know, we've always been, that was the space, the finished space. Um, and it was always really important to kind of, you know, be quite boisterous, you know, sort of say, oh look, we're here, we're doing this, pay attention to us. You yeah, know, being quite annoying, basically. Um, so that was, that was the second event we did at Shoes. Um, this is the most recent event, the No Ground 6 launch. Um, we had uh, Liam Barrett uh, from UWE, he did a big, uh, devil with a, with a big blue hoodie chasing a guy on a bike, and it was like an animatronic thing. It was very cool. Um, there you go. The guy on the bike has a really small pump. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it was good. It was it was a good it was good fun. Uh, we had a, we had a fun night, you know, um, and it was good for promoting the D magazine. That's just like a whole bunch of books together. This is an example of our printing, you know, mass production of this kind of, of, the, of using the same principles as screen printing, but with a book. This book really looks screen printed, but it's done with this offset lighting process. But it's kind of, you know, it's. It, I think it's the most successful, you know, color job that we've done. So that's what I'm doing. 
Um, this next, these next few slides, it's really to represent what I said before, the comics that we do. Um, John McNaught found them online. I loved his work. And, uh, and I got in touch with him and I said, you know, he had done virtual clothes and self-initiated handmade book. And uh, I wanted to turn it into a physical thing and put it out there in shops. So I called him up and convinced him to kind of extend it and add things to it. So, so we kind of put it together. And this is, you know, it's been really a really formative experience working with him because we, you know, a lot of people really like this book. A lot of people, a, a lot of people in the comics community, when they saw this book, for them it cemented, you know, our kind of position in the comics community as well. And they said, oh, these guys are doing something interesting and new. And, and, uh, and so it was really great to work with them. Um, this is a, another, uh, and, and that's been a very successful book. This is another book that's been very successful, the Constantina book, Rise and Fall by Mitha Lidbo. It was really, it just came from the idea of working with Mitha on the things that he loves the most. He loves drawing dinosaurs, and so we tried to find a context where he would be able to draw dinosaurs, and it wouldn't be completely and utterly random. At least there would be some sense to it or some concept behind it. So Rise and Fall was really about uh, a, you know, a visual story of the rise of the dinosaur, the rise and fall of the dinosaurs, and the, the rise of the mammals uh, once they became extinct. Um, and this has been enormously popular, and, and has sparked a number of other Constantine books since then. And a few pictures. This is what I was talking about before. Macbeth. We did a comic with him that the vinyl, and it's an actual seven-inch um, EP. <coughs> we um, he wrote the, the the story in the comic book so that it corresponded to verses in the song. So you know you could kind of listen to it and read it and you know have a whole experience. And then at the end of the comic, you know, he, he's holding a, a physical object. And you know we've done a number of projects with him since then. And, you know it's been great to work. That's Big Mother. It's like an, it's it's sort of a solo artist project where we. We get artists to be, you know, to give us their best work. We, we make a selection from it, and we make a sort of limited edition artwork, which isn't too expensive. It's kind of affordable, but it's limited, so it's kind of cool. Uh, graphic cosmogony, that, that's another thing, comic thing we did, which was, you know, had a big impact. Um, one of the things we found, you know, fairly soon into trying out this whole publishing thing was was the bookshops are not very um, willing to take things that don't have spines. So we realized we had to put together a big, some kind of big book so that they would take that seriously. So we thought, well, we'll put together an anthology because there aren't any British comics anthologies that are any good. They're all kind of Batman 2018, whatever stuff. And, um, and we were thinking, you know, what about Kramer's O Go? What about, you know, Best of American Comics? What about McSweeney's, you know, 13, you know, these amazing, you know, comics anthologies, and there's nothing like it in the UK, so okay, we'll give it a shot. Uh, because it was the first one we did, we started at the beginning, and we asked the 24 artists, we gave them seven pages, so 24 7, and they had to tell their own tale of creation in seven pages. Um, but they were, you know, anything from made up to Judeo Christian to tribal myths to whatever. Um, and it was relatively this is when we first uh, started setting up a shop, which was initially an exhibition space, more than a shop. Uh, our first preparation for our first exhibition with Jack Teagle. Um, it, you know, it was a lot of fun doing these. We did a lot of them. There's me painting the sign for the window. Um, and obviously, we, we always got, I mean, now Sam and I don't have a lot of time, but you know, at the beginning, we were getting involved. We got involved a lot creatively with stuff and drawing, making, and you know, hands-on stuff. So we always did that. Um, now, that's the kind of finished show. As you can see, there's you know, we only had three books at the time, so it's like millions of copies of three books basically. That's our shop stock. So it wasn't really a shop, you know, it was just an exhibition space. And if we had a till somewhere over there, and someone would buy something just do it with cash. It was really like basic and you know kind of I don't know unprofessional probably. Um, but the gallery sort of did well and as the gallery did well we kind of bought some more 
you know, everything has been incremental at Nova. We've built over the time gradually, you know, rather than putting all our eggs into one basket. And we've been able to see what works and what doesn't work. For example, the, um, the exhibitions, whilst they were great and they were really good for our profile, um, in terms of selling stuff, um, a lot of people who wanted to buy the work had a certain you know, price bracket they were working with it. And um, so the cheap stuff sold really well, but the expensive stuff didn't sell too well. And you know, when you're trying to pay for the rent of a space, you, know, you kind of need to be either selling a lot or a few small pieces that are very expensive or big pieces that are very expensive. So we kind of, as we realized, we were kind of working through, we realized actually books and reading clubs and all the other stuff were selling really well. So we gradually expanded the bookshop side of things, and that's why now it's kind of a bookshop with, you know, some gallery space dedicated to some work. Um, but the other thing was that Sam and I, you know, we're, we're, we're publishers, so our main job is to find new artists, develop new content, sell and market our books, distribute them. And so doing shows every two months was very distracting, very distracting for us personally, because we weren't really a collective of artists anymore. We were, you know, we were a company. And so we just didn't have the time to do them well, as well as we wanted to. So we thought it's better to stop doing the shows and to stop on a high note than to continue and spend less time on them. So now really it's, it's, a, it's a bookshop and we have all the books that we love and our books and everything as well. Um, this is a 17 by 23 series I was talking about before. It was set up as a platform for young artists. Um, we wanted to give them achievable goals. 24 page comic is not completely you know, outside of the realm of possibility for someone fresh out of college. Although, you know, a lot of publishers were asking people who won, let's say, the Observer Cape Prize or something like that to do a 200 page graphic novel as their first ever book, which is ludicrous because they had no experience. So we thought we'll start out small, so we did this kind of thing. And we tried our hand at toy making as well. Um, I mean, Sam and I, coming from creative backgrounds, we try a lot of different things. We design a lot of different things. So we kind of tried this out. And when we tried this out, we realized actually, you know, the vinyl toy thing is a very risky business and, and very expensive. So we did it, and then we thought, okay, maybe we should wait until we have a bit more money before trying it again. Uh, but uh, it was really cool and really fun to do. Um, so yeah, so th these are more of the comics, new ghost. Um, and, and always with the comics, it's about doing things that were different, you know. Um, and then, you know, eventually we, we came across Luke, Luke Pearson, uh, who we now work with a lot. Uh, this is his adult comic, Everything We Missed, which is really, really solid story. It's really good. But he also does Hilda Folk, obviously, which it has, you know, kind of mass appeals, kids and adults and everything. Um, but this is a really great story. This was his second book. His fir first book was actually not the first. Um, we've been, that's an example of his inked pages before they're colored. Uh, that's Hilda Folk, his first book. Uh, and Hilda and the Midnight Giant. The first book Hilda Folk did so well. Um, I mean, at the moment, even though it's a little pamphlety, shitty thing, um, it sold close to 6,000 copies. Um, and so, we thought, okay, it's probably worth doing, you know, a, a series. So we've started doing a series with Hilda and Night Giant. And then there'll be hardback uh, follow-ups to that. Um, Luke is a pleasure to work with. And, you know, this is another thing I'd say. When you work with, with people, you have to remember that they're always your clients. And there are some people that we've worked with, and I won't name names, but because they weren't very pleasant to work with and they were a bit difficult, I mean, within reason. Um, we, we don't work with him as much anymore. It really helps that Luke is receptive. He has his own ideas about things, but he's receptive to having input from us. Uh, and he's really good to work with. So we work a lot with him. This is Klaus, Holbert. A whole bunch of books here. Holbert is an encyclopedia of sorts of Q, uh, Q words. It's very, very small though. Um, and then these are some other events that we've done. I'm just trying to steam ahead. Oh, that's it. Okay. Um, one thing I'll mention is online presence from the beginning has been very important because there have been months where we haven't been paid by our distributors yet or whatever the case is or there's a dip in the book market and in that time we're always selling books online and that's really important. 
when selling our products. So even if you're making prints or whatever, it's, it's always good to try your hand in it. Um, you have access to the whole world. I mean, it's annoying to kind of working out the logistics of sending everything out. You need help and you need to, I mean, we had to hire someone to do it eventually. But, um, but having a good online presence is crucial because, you know, all of these big companies that have been around for 50 years, they don't really understand the importance of these things. And they're these big, lumbering kind of dinosaurs. And, uh, you know, in three years, thanks to our online presence, we've managed to have access to a lot of things that they have had access to just because we've had a good online presence, so it's always been important. Um, and yeah, this is, a, this is how we hope to be in a few years, but we're very far away from this. It's like maybe this bit, that's it. Uh, but, um, that was another thing, you know, it's about the brand. Uh, really, you know, we wanted to have a strong brand, we wanted to you know, we wanted to make ourselves seem more important than we were. You know, at this, at this point, we were only, I think, three or four people in the studio. Now we're like six or seven, so we're still not huge. But um, uh, this was really kind of saying, okay, we're serious, take us seriously. And it's just through a drawing, really. It's just saying, you know, this is us. But, you know, no one actually visited us at the time. So we weren't lying. It was very tongue in cheek, but, you know, it's kind of, anyway. So that's it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I hope it's been of some use to you. I, I, I know you're all going out, you're going to, as I said, go into various areas of, uh, of illustration, and I wish you all the best of luck with it. Um, but just, you know, keep, make sure you all have some kind of blog, please, because people aren't going to find you if you don't put yourself out there. And, um, you know, and, and, and think about where your work is, it should be targeted, you know, if you're, if you're born to do comics, submit stuff to us or to another publisher. If you're born to do editorial stuff, submit it there. If you're a general person, chuck it all out there and see what happens, you know. But good luck, thanks for your patience, and uh, thanks for listening to me. Illustrators were kind of, kind of um, respond to you know um, in a well sort of way. Um, have they ever come back to you and tried to get? No, I mean we're all it? friends and we're you know we're still friends with them. But if you're really difficult with your client, well, I was meaning like you know in the beginning you were saying that uh, they told you kind of to fuck up and yeah, like yeah. To start off. But no, I mean, they kind of come back once you kind of. Oh yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, um, uh, we <clears throat> we had this one one guy who we tried at the beginning, and he was very dismissive. And a couple of years later, he was like, "Hey guys, how are you? Like, <laughs> you want to work together?" And we were like, "Fuck it all." <laughs> In a very polite way, though, we were basically like, "Fuck off." Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, that does happen. That has happened definitely, and. You know, it's it, it's gone to the stage where it's very easy to get people involved in the projects, but that was never that that wasn't always the case. You know, it's happened with time. Um, but uh, we also you we also have to be careful now that it's easy to get kind of famous illustrators that we don't just do that because then you're running into this sort of danger of perpetuating the kind of uh, the state of illustration as it is, and you just republish the same. 18 people year upon year upon year and that's what happened before you know I'm not saying just before us a lot of people have come around since then a lot of amazing collectives have come up and stuff um, but you know the, the, the Tashin stuff and the and the Lawrence King stuff and it's all great but it was the same 25 people in all of the books and it was getting very boring right and and so you know that's what happens when you become complacent and we have to be careful not to do that the other thing I would say though is coming back to uh, you know working with people who are, who are kind of a pleasure to work with or not. Um, you always have to remember that you know I'm not saying you should be a slave to your client by any means, but you always have to remember that you know the client is basically going to be paying you, and and probably you know <coughs> you you'll you'll need their repeat business because there aren't that many companies or or, or there aren't that many institutions or companies or things like that that employ illustrators on a regular basis. So in all likelihood, when you're out there in the world and you're working as an illustrator, you're going to find a few clients you work for regularly. 
especially if you're in editorial administration or in publishing, children's publishing, whatever it is. It's really important to have a good attitude, to be good to people, not to be arrogant, not to, you know, to be humble. But if you have your own opinion, make it heard, but just be respectful. Because when you when you're when you're kind of annoying to work with, someone may work with you once, but they'll never they'll they'll all, in all likelihood not come back to you, and you don't want that to happen. You know you don't want to burn any bridges. So that's that. Anyway, uh, I've bored you long enough. Thanks no. for your attention. Any I'm gonna head off. Any more questions? Uh, one more. Yeah. Uh, do you reckon like the success of Nova was kind of like the the how well the work works together is like a complete set. Like, even though like it's quite diverse on the stuff, it, yeah. it works. Like, if you're gonna like one bit, you're quite likely to like yeah. the next bit a lot. Yeah. Do you reckon that is? Better? Yeah. No, we work really. We work really hard to make sure each magazine has like a cohesive yeah. works as a cohesive whole, um, and that's why we kind of shift focus. You know, like the, uh, the black and white one. There are a lot of very tight, you know, drawing people in there alongside a lot of very bold people because of the colour scheme. Uh, but then the next one, it was kind of a lot more painterly, you know, and it kind of, it changes, but when it changes, we make sure that as many people as we can, you know, kind of go together as possible. Because they are supposed to be these things that you collect and each one works on its own. So I think, yeah, that's really important, getting it to work. It's like an exhibition in a book, yeah, basically. Yeah. Sort of curated thing. I was just wondering, like, how, how involved do you get with the illustrators and the kind of, like with the comics, their narrative? Well, I mean, the comics, you, we have, I have to get involved with the comics. But with everything we do, we have to edit stuff, basically. Um, at the beginning, we, we, we had quite, we gave quite a lot of free reign to people. To, I mean, Ben, for example, I just said to him, you know, do you want to, like, I love your work. I love the best, best work. What do you want to do? Do you want to do something? And then he did it. But since then, we've obviously realized certain things worked, other things don't. So we kind of have to use our experience to, to, to make sure that whatever it is, whatever, whatever project we work on with someone has every chance of success. And that's where the editing process comes in. So with a comic book, I'll see three or four drafts of roughs before the final thing. But it's more of a collaboration than me shouting down the phone saying this is shit, you're a little turd, you know, like, work harder, you know, it, it's, it, it's not like that, it's like, it's a discussion thing, really. so that, that's, yeah, I think, yeah, it's that. Alright, I've got to get back to work guys, thanks for your patience.